I ask my dad, if I cannot do the service, can I hire someone? That's when I realized just how much like my dad I was, because he too evaded the question and changed the subject. <laughs> At least I come by it honestly. <coughs> Let me start by telling you a little bit about my dad. He was born to William and Ada Flett on June 3rd, 1934. He had two sisters, Dorothy and Jean, and he was, of course, their little prince. Along the way, he adopted my Uncle Vinny as his own brother. He was married to his loving wife, Marilyn. His children combined are, and let me take a breath for this, please. <laughs> Roxanne, Glenna, Nancy, Tom, Crystal, Chris, Robert, Andy, Janet, Steve, Kathy, Murray, Rose, Gary, Bev, the late Catherine, Victor, and Letty. His grandchildren are the late Travis, Sarah Ann, AJ, Amy, Corey, Kelly, Melinda, Julie, Jonathan, Beverly, David, Nicole, Robin, Calvin, Jody, Nick, Melanie, Ben, Olivia, Laura, Jeff, Andrew, Mike, and Andrea. His great-grandchildren are Katie, Nathan, Lucas, Lily, Valerie, Jacob, Marcus, Travis, Jackson, Drake, Noah, Zoe, Taylor, and Alyssa. <sighs> Way to go, Jim. Good thing. <laughs> No wonder that Hallmark is such a profitable company. <coughs> Anyways, as I, as I said, over time, I thought about Dad's service, and I finally said yes. But this is where it got hard. See, my dad did believe in God, and he did believe in heaven, but he was not a religious man. A traditional service certainly would not suit him. I thought long and hard about what to write for a service for somebody who didn't even know what the box was, never mind think outside the box. I knew that Dad hated it when we cried, but I knew also that he wanted to make people laugh every day. When I asked him why he wanted me to do the service, he said that I was the glue that held the family together, so it just seemed fitting. He also said that out of the services he had seen me do, he loved the fact that I celebrated life and not mourn the death, and that there was humor in those services. The service will be no different. In that sense, as far as celebrating life, he was certainly one that had a life that was so worth celebrating, like no one else. I had thoughts running through my head like crazy. These thoughts made me think about my dad in heaven, and that thought made me think about the fact that he'd get to meet God. I thought about that first meeting that dad would have with God, and I couldn't help but made me laugh. I pictured Dad walking into the most beautiful office, and there behind the desk was a chair facing backwards. He said, is that you, God? The chair turns around, Dad sees God for the first time. He opens his eyes wide, and as God asks if he's okay, yes, Dad says, it's just that you look very different than what I had expected. Who are you expecting, George Burns? Mm. Oh, God. <laughs> Have a seat, James. Dad sits down wondering what to say or do, but God tells me he has to go over the paperwork of his life. <coughs> okay, God says. <coughs> Have a look, shall we? So, I see you went by Jim. Gentleman Jim. Because you still bowed to the ladies and kissed their hands. You had your mom and dad, two sisters, were married to Pat, Valerie, and third time to charm, lovely wife Marilyn. <coughs> Eighteen grandchildren, twenty-four great-grandchildren, fourteen great-grandchildren. Um, Jim, you are aware of the fact that when I said go forth and populate the earth, I mean specifically you. <coughs> I know I'm God and all-knowing, but chances are my guess would be you didn't have cable. No, God, you see, I was blessed with three brats, I mean, beautiful girls. And the rest, well, they were treasures that I picked up along the way. I see that you were a city boy from the junction, and that you were in the Navy. Very nice. Then you became a cowboy. City boy to cowboy? Now there's a jump for you. You were a rodeo rider, a horse trainer, salesman, gunfighter? Really? You were also a stuntman and an actor, a knight in charming, shining armor, and a jouster. What, you couldn't find your niche and stick with it? Oh well, isn't this nice? 
I see that everyone thought that you were me, God said. What do you mean by that, Dad says? Because every time you tell a joke, they go, oh, God, Jim. <laughs> I also see that your wife, Marilyn, thought that you were perfect. Oh, wait a minute, that's perfect idiot. I get that wrong. <laughs> well, Jim, it's pretty clear that your life was filled with love. But more so, it was filled with laughter. Looking at all this, it would seem that you certainly didn't waste the time that I gave you. You had one heck of a full life. Honestly, God, it was a wild ride. And I wouldn't miss any of it for anything. Do you have any questions or concerns, Jim? I do, God. One very big concern. What's that? I'm concerned about the people that I leave behind. When I was on Earth, I tried to take care of as many people as I could. I tried to help whenever I could. What's going to happen to the loved ones if I'm not there to help them? Oh, Jim, you don't get it. I created love. And your love can reach from heaven to Earth and their love can reach from earth to heaven. When well, I created love, I created it without boundaries. I understand that, but what if they need me, God? When I created you, I knew what you had to teach those you love, and I didn't call you home until those lessons were taught. You can still keep an eye on all of them, and they can still talk to you whenever they want, and they'll hear you. All they have to do is just listen. Quietly listen. Besides, believe it or not, looking out for them, that's my job. But it never hurts to have an angel like you watching over them. God, why'd you call me home right now, just before Christmas? I chose now because you had one more lesson left to teach. What's that, God? You need to show the people that Christmas is not about lights or songs or even presents. It's about touching those we love in a very profound way that can never be forgotten. <coughs> Jim, you touch so many people in so many ways that mere words can never explain. Out of all the things you taught everyone, what do you think are the most important lessons? I guess it would be to love each other, to help each other when you can. Never, ever be afraid to act silly and laugh every day. I think the only other lesson that I would leave is to never miss an opportunity to say I love you because you never know when your time on earth will come to an end. After all, I was the most immortal person known. And look at me, hello! Well, Jim, you're home now and you're healthy. And most of all, you can see better now than you ever did in life. So what happens now, God? Right now there's a lot of people who've been missing you since I called them home, and they're waiting to see you. Do you have any final words for those you left behind? Yes, I do, God. Keep laughing, but more importantly, keep loving each other. Thanks for being a part of me that I will always treasure. Until we meet again, I love you all. Now, I'm not really sure that's how the interview would go, but I'm guessing I'm not really that far off. Due to the time of year, unfortunately, there are some people that could not be here today, but they have sent some things for me to read. The first is from a dear friend, Larry Rivers. <coughs> Black Heart, there were six, six majestic angels at the altar of the throne when on that night, December 16th, they called another angel home. Many people knew his name, but he went by just Black Bart. He's riding with the angels now, but he lives within my heart. When at first I met this man, he looked so worn and rough, but he explained to me it was life that made him tough. Through the years, a kinder man I have surely never met. To most people, he was Black Bart. To me, he was Jim Flett. He taught me how to ride a horse and draw my colts real fast. He also taught me not to judge, a memory that will last. He's riding with the angels now, with Jesus by his side. Two cowboys riding in the clouds, their head held up with pride. Although his time is over now, his time on earth has passed. His memory of his smile 
that will forever last. So as we bow our heads today, we all think of him for the love we had for dear Jim. The second writing is from Louise, who was kind of an adopted sister of Dad's. Regretfully, Anthony and I are unable to attend here today to honour our brother and best friend, Jim McGuire. <coughs> he was the best man, and Marilyn was her maid of honour at our wedding. Jim was the best man we had ever known, and Marilyn was the wind beneath his wings. We just want to say that in our 60 years, we've never met anyone that can respect as much as Jimmy. He was honourable, impeccable in his integrity, wise, humble, ethical, compassionate, caring, strong, fair, honest, authentic, kind and uplifting. Never gossiped or said a bad word about anyone. He could always make you smile, if not totally crack up. His laugh made my day. <coughs> he would not hurt a bug unless it was harming someone he cared about. He walked the talk 100%. He made everyone feel special, and there was nothing he would not do for his friends and loved ones. He was always a gallant gentleman, a knight in shining armor. We are all less without Jimmy, but he left a legacy. So many happy memories to smile about. Let us all focus on those and celebrate his life. How blessed we all were to be touched by his incredible soul. Let us all see him as our favorite cowboy, riding off into the sunset, tipping his hat. Happy trails, dearest brother and friend. Please save us a place, because we want to be with you when it's our time to go home. One is only gone if they're not remembered. Let us all keep Jimmy's memory alive and speak of him as an example of what a real gentleman would strive to be from the hearts of Louise and Anthony. The next reading I have is from John Stone, or Stoney, to us. <coughs> like everyone here, I am missing him. To be with Jimmy was a friend, sometimes like a father, sometimes like my older brother, and always that cowboy buddy on the trail. I'll miss that Elvis Presley-like singing voice as he knew the words to endless numbers of old cowboy tunes. Going to miss that time around the fire pit as we talked about all the cowboys, real and Hollywood. We also talked of how old we were both getting and soon time to move on. Of course, our idea of moving on was to go back to the era of the cowboy where we'd both been carrying guns on our hips all the time and pushing few thousand heads of cattle through the dust. That's Jimmy and me, born too late. Jimmy and I are like two kids playing cowboys all the time. I say, I say are and were. As I still play cowboy, I know Jimmy is riding in the sky with the big cattle herd, his hat, gun and boots on, or sitting at the table with John Wayne or Randolph Scott. I hope he's not getting ready for a fast R shootout with John Wesley Harden or Wyatt Earp, knowing Jimmy, he probably is. Jimmy taught me to be grateful for what you have, because he was. He taught me through his example to be accepting, kind, unless you were a squirrel in the eavesdrops or a raccoon in the attic. To be understanding, forgiving, and loving. He taught me to appreciate, and of course, what he appreciated and loved most was his family, his daughters, and his wife, Marilyn. Didn't I hear that about a million times? Jimmy was the most loving, caring, giving human in the world. The man would give you the shirt off his back, and indeed, I actually saw him do literally that. I do not need to say sorry I can't be there at the funeral, because I carry Jimmy in my heart, and will forever. We, until I decide to join him at the shootout, he needs me after all. I was a good guy, Lone Star Cowboy, in that shootout. <coughs> so pave the way for us, Jimmy, as you did for us coming here in the first place. We'll all be seeing you sooner or later. I hear none of us get out alive. I love you, cowboy. Um, at this
this time, I would like to call Roxanne forward, my sister. Thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, all the words that have been said um, by Nancy and by the other people, and the people who I've talked to over the past few days and stuff, I think um, Roger's the source. Um, all the words have been used. Um, <coughs> saying all the wonderful things that Daddy's done for so many people. I've heard a lot of people say how they'll miss him. Well, like Nancy says, um, we don't mourn people's passing, we celebrate their lives. And um, Daddy, <laughs> he lived more life. <laughs> he, um, a, a lot of people, you know, they're, they're born, they live their lives, and they go. And I remember as a little girl, Dad telling me, Dad would get, you know how Daddy would get very intense. And he'd say, Sam, you have to make your mark on this world. You have to make your mark in life. Let people know you. And he, and he pointed at the pyramids and all sorts of fun stuff, right? And that was always really important <coughs> down there to Daddy. And if any of you are even thinking of missing him, he's not gone. Number one, our bodies are just our vehicles for our soul. And our souls are timeless and immortal. Um, everything is energy, and he's just moved into a new energy. Number two, he lives on in myself and my sisters, Glenna and Nancy. He lives within us physically. Yes, we share some of the same ailments that he did. <laughs> but a lot of the same characteristics. <coughs> He also is part of us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, our senses of humor, our, our, a lot of our philosophies, our ethics, our morals. They came from mom too, she buffered daddy, but um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of them, um, I, 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 I write songs and I wrote a song for dad's birthday um, called Pearls My Father Gave Me and it was basically saying um, the, the, little, the little pearls of wisdom. Well, Dad was full of pearls of wisdom. And, you know, if, if, if you listen, you get them. <laughs> he had, um, when I was very little, Daddy hated crying, as Nancy said. And so when I was just real tiny, when I'd start to go, <laughs> he'd go, laugh. It didn't matter if my leg was hanging off by a piece <laughs> of skin. Laugh, Sam, come on, laugh. That's it, ha ha. So I like, ha, 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 ha. and then I start laughing. <laughs> but he didn't have to hear me cry. And um, <clears throat> Daddy lives in each and every one of you. He's touched everybody's lives. Um, all the people that have been here for the past two days and today, and a lot of people who couldn't make it, and a lot of people who don't even know he's gone. I remember him saying when he went to Spain, I think it was Spain, he was at a bullfight and some guy with a couple of seats over went, excuse me, aren't you Black Bart? <laughs> of course that just made him go like this. But um, anyways, um, he lived a very long life. The whole time I was growing up, all I ever heard was that daddy was going to be gone by 40 because his dad died at 40 and his dad's dad and his dad's 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 dad. Everybody was going to die at 40 if you're on the male side. And... Um, we got almost 41 extra years out of him, so hey. <laughs> and considering he's had every bone in his body broken at least three times and been through hell and back, a lot of it self-inflicted, you think after the third time he'd learn you cannot punch a horse in the jaw. The jaw is stronger than the human hand. <laughs> but that was daddy. <laughs> and um, he, he, he lived more in his one life than most people do in ten. And he was a good man. He helped out wherever he could, as you already heard, so I'm not going to go over all that stuff. <coughs> um, I have a, a Buddhist prayer. It's called the Bardo, Bardo Prayer. 
and if you would please. O angels, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, abiding in all directions, endowed with great compassion, endowed with foreknowledge, <coughs> endowed with divine eye, endowed with love, affording protection to sentient beings, please, through the power of your great compassion, come forth. Please bring these offerings, both actually presented and mentally created. O compassionate ones, you who possess the wisdom of understanding, the love of compassion, the power of doing divine deeds, and of protecting in incomprehensible measure, James William Flett is passing from this world to the next. He is taking a great leap. The light of this world has faded for him. He has entered solitude with his karmic forces. He has gone into a vast silence. He is borne away by the great ocean of birth and death. O oh, compassionate ones, protect James William Flett, who is defenseless. Be to him like a father and mother. O oh, compassionate ones, let not the force of your compassion be weak, but aid him. Let James William Flett not go into miserable states of existence. Forget not your ancient vows. And that being said, um, as you know, cowboys, you know, besides their horses and their guns, and they, they love songs and they also love poems, as we've seen. <laughs> um, I'd just like to um, recite this for you, if I may. We're the daughter of cowboy. We learn to rope and shoot and ride. We're the daughters of a cowboy. We were raised to no cowboy pride. A cowboy's always helpful. He never quits till the job is done. A cowboy will always do his best. On that you can rely on. There's many cowboys that we've known when we were growing up. Their names were wild, their stories tall, and they were tough as all get out. There was Lion Tom and Romp and Ron. Dusty roads I could go on and on. Old Vern and I mended fences. There was Gentleman Jim and a fella called Slim. There was Mouth the Knife. Uh, the Flying Dutchman. Well, he was aces. They loved the horses that they knew, from Price Stallion to the Duke. Each day was an adventure, and they'd take it. A cowboy, he is honest, as the day is long. And you bet your bottom daughter, a dollar, he'll always right or wrong. A cowboy is a gentleman when there's lady folks around, but all bets are off when he goes to town. A cowboy's rough and tumble, and known to join the odd million. But a cowboy's grateful for all, his, for all he has and gives thanks on bended knee. We're the daughters of a cowboy. We learn to rope and shoot and ride. We're the daughters of a cowboy. We were raised to no cowboy pride. Thank you. Call my sister Glenna forward. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Jim's daughter, Glenna. Eighteen years ago on this day, I laid my husband to rest, my children's father. This time, it's my father. I guess you could say I'm a bit emotional, but Dad would never want to see us cry. He loved to laugh, his deep, hearty laugh. And so, and I, so I'm going to tell you a little story. Dad and Marilyn, Mom, had met us one day at Marineland to spend the day with myself and my late husband, Donnie, 
and to enjoy a day with their grandkids. Dad, Marilyn, and Donnie and I, and my two youngest, Corey and Kelly, went to the animal castle to see the, to see the deer. Dad took out a $5 bill from his pocket to buy the kids corn to feed the deers. Suddenly this big buck grabbed the money from Dad's hand and tried to eat it. <coughs> well, what came next was one of the fondest memories of Dad. Without skipping a beat, Dad said, you're not taking my money, you SOB. And with that, he put the deer in a headlock, pried open its mouth, and retrieved his money. <laughs> that deer never knew what it was. <laughs> So please, remember my dad's laughter and that fond memories we all have. And lastly, I'd like to just say, old cowboys never die. They just go off riding in the sky. I'd like to call Cole forward, please. Those who don't know me, Jim was my uncle. And my best friend. There's not much I can tell you about him that most of you don't already know. For me personally, I was a sidekick, I guess from the day I could walk. Because at a very early age, he was hauling me around to rodeos. Much to the chagrin of my parents, who thought horses, the only place for them was in a can. <laughs> and you talk about people being an influence on your life, with him being in horses and him driving me around to the rodeos and the horse shows and everything else, I ended up being in horses because of him. Everything I learned about horses, I learned from him. There was never a guy who would not steer you wrong. If you got out of line, he was the first one to give you a slap up alongside the head or a kick in the butt. And he always treated people fair. If anybody was in trouble, his first question was, how can I help you? And that was Jim all his life. No matter who you were, where you came from, or what your status was, he would be one of the first people there to help you. Even though he's not here physically, he will never die to the people who knew, who knew him. <coughs> he's always in your heart and in your mind. God rest his soul. Thank you. I understand that there was another gentleman that wanted to get up and speak. I think it was Randy Butcher, but I'm not sure. They spoke to Marilyn about it. That would be me. Okay. Not Randy, unfortunately. <clears throat> Hi folks. My name is R.D. Reed. Uh, I had the pleasure and the privilege of calling Jimmy Flett, my friend, for about uh, two and a half decades. I also had the uh, pleasure and the privilege of directing him in uh, two shows and performing with him in dozens. And uh, the previous speaker, his nephew, said that uh, we all knew stories about Jimmy. I have a story that only I know. I'm going to tell it to you. But uh, 
in a minute. Jimmy was to me a consummate gentleman. He was one of nature's gentlemen, very rare breed. Uh, when he showed up on set for rehearsals, he had his lines cold. Total professional. You directed him once, he had it down. He was a great energy on stage. I don't have to tell you, he had a presence. If there was a villain to be played, there he is. Uh, enough of that. We were doing a show, I can't remember if it was Syracuse or Rochester or something like that. We'd been gone three or four days. Jimmy and I had shared a hotel room. And uh, the last day we're heading home Sunday night and we stopped off for uh, dinner at a Tex-Mex place. I can't remember what we had. I had something different from Jimmy. What I had was fine. What Jimmy had, Montezuma was waiting for him. <laughs> <laughs> and Montezuma didn't like Jimmy Flett. Uh, it hit him real hard as soon as we hit the highway. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because I know Jimmy, because we talked about this many times and laughed about it many times. So I hope he's laughing up there. As soon as we hit the highway, he's in trouble. And it just got worse. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that from Rochester to the Niagara border, we hit every single gas station with a washroom. <laughs> every one. I'm not kidding. We got to the uh, customs at 2 o'clock on a Monday morning. Nobody around. A young girl had pulled the night shift. She was the customs officer. We pulled in. Jimmy has guns in the back of the car. and He's driving. And all the way there, I'm telling Jimmy, Jimmy, let me drive. I can drive. And they said, no, it's okay. I can make it. It's all right. <laughs> and they was, no, it's okay. I can make it. <laughs> Etc. We get to the customs. Uh, Jimmy's uh, getting ready for his paperwork here. The girl says, uh, anything to declare, Jimmy said. Yes, I have uh, guns in the back. And he turned, as he was saying this, he turned away and said, but I have my paperwork here. And he turned back. And remember, Jimmy's in trouble here, big trouble. And the girl said to him, do you have any paperwork? And Jimmy said, I just said that. What, are you deaf? <laughs> <laughs> my turn to go, oh God. <laughs> so we knew, I knew what was happening, I'm sure Jimmy did too, but the girl looked at him, looked at the papers, looked at him, looked at the papers, and said, uh, it's two o'clock in the morning, there's nobody around. The girl said, okay, sir, just pull over to that building and we'll have somebody come out and speak to you. Jimmy looked at her, he looked back at me, and I thought, He's looking like somebody that's just told him he's going to be beheaded in the morning. <laughs> so we drove over, we parked, and you know, customs people are full of human good and kindness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they kept us waiting there for five minutes, ten minutes, and Jimmy was in serious difficulty. So I got out, went into the office, and I said, look, my buddy is in trouble here. He really needs help. Can you please? So they said, sure, we'll be right out. Ten minutes later. They come out, the guy looks at Jimmy, I said, could he please use the washroom, he really has to go. And the guy said, sure, go ahead. And Jimmy Flett, to this day, I will never forget how he walked to that bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it was the greatest imitation of John Wayne I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy doesn't come off good in that story, but we talked about it and we laughed, and thank goodness you did too. <laughs> but a lot has been said about his laughter, and that's what I remember about the guy. A great friend. I am going to try and sing a song, just one verse and one uh, chorus. If I start to blubber, I'm going to stop, because he'll kick my ass, and he'll come out of the coffin to kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's called... Uh, it's called Here's Hope. I'd ask Tommy to help me, but he, we haven't rehearsed, so here it is. <clears throat> By the way you watch that sunset, I can tell. 
Soon you will travel down that old, by the way you watch that sunset I can tell. Soon you'll saddle up that old strawberry roan. Bid goodbye to the good life loving trail. Set off to find a new trail of your own. I know you'll travel light like you always do. But you'll always take a part of me with you. So here's hoping. There's an open road before you. Here's hoping, here's knowing that your aim is always true. And when you're trying to outrun that setting sun, here's hoping that you do. At this moment, I would ask all of you to indulge me for just a few moments. Marilyn, Mummy Three. On behalf of Roxanne, Glenna, Crystal, Robbie, and myself, we want to say thank you. We know the fact that if it was not for your unconditional love for Dad, and most times your exhausting, <coughs> unlimited care of him, that we would have lost him many years ago. For this, we will be eternally grateful. We want you to know that we love you. Whether he's here or not, you can't get rid of us. Nope. Thank you. Daddy, I know you can hear me, and I want to thank you for all that you taught me. I want to thank you for all the good qualities I got from you, but mostly for your strength. And more so, your very warped sense of humor. <laughs> I want to thank you for loving me unconditionally and making me feel like I was the most important person on the face of the earth. Most people only get 15 minutes of fame. But because of you, I had 51. And that's really weird considering I'm only 25 and you're only 39. <laughs> <laughs> In Cle Ecclesiastics tells us to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. My dad's time has come and gone, but it's not sad. Because from the amount of people that have come through these doors in the past three days, I would say the time of keeping my dad alive through remembering will carry on for a very, very long time. I guess if I had to sum up my dad's life in just a few short words, I'd have to say that there are some that he met. They didn't like him very much. He put them in their place. And there are some that he met. They loved him with all the heart that they have. But I promise that there is no one that ever met my dad that will ever forget him. And that includes me, Daddy. I've always been Daddy's little girl, and that will never stop. You will always be with me, and I will always be with you. I love you, Daddy. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for sharing your son James with us. We thank you for the knowledge that he is safe in your arms and wrapped in the serapi of love. We thank you for the knowledge that we will see him again when our time comes to be called home. We thank you for allowing someone so special to touch our lives and for the common bond that joins us, each of us, one to the other, with love for him. We thank you for the gift of memory and for all the wonderful memories that we have of my dad. For these things we are truly grateful and we thank you for all of this, dear Lord, through your precious son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes the service for today. We will be going from here to Defogger Lawn Cemetery on Dundas, almost right at Lions Lane. If you need a ride, or if you can give someone a ride, please stay in this room for just a moment once everyone leaves. After the cemetery service, you are all invited back here for a light lunch and fellowship. 
If you do not wish to attend the cemetery service, please feel free to go downstairs to the reception room and have coffee. On behalf of all Jim Flett's family, we want to thank you for sharing this day with us and for sharing my dad's life. If you would please remain seated for just a moment as the pallbearers get ready, then allow the front rows to exit first towards the back. Pallbearers, would you please come forward? Do you want to hold on to it and give it at the cemetery? Close it. 